I can't excite you, but I know the Holy Spirit of God can. Amen. We can, you know, just as we just sang that great song. You know, that's the exact verse we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks from Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. What did the Apostle Paul say? He said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but what? But it is Christ that lives in me. Man, that is so important because, you know, with that, if Christ is living in you, then dear friend, you're not going to be unnatural. You're not going to be natural. You're going to be supernatural. And that's what we want to talk about, the supernatural life that the Christian is supposed to live. And so if you've got your Bible, we're going to act some, just kind of an overview of some great truths from the book of Acts. And this is our second week talking about the supernatural life that the Lord has for us. And so Acts chapter 2, and if you look at verse 22, just before we read there, um, I want to remind you of the meeting tonight that starts at 530 and uh, we're going to be discussing the future plans for the sanctuary up on the property. And so we'd love for you to come. It's going to be very informal. Uh, you can wear your house shoes if you like. And uh, very informal, we're going to be talking about um, just a dream for the sanctuary. And so if you would come and just say, hey, here are some ideas that I have. This is what I would like to see. Uh, that would be a real blessing. That's what the meeting is all about, is for you to bring your ideas and share those ideas. We're going to write those ideas down. We're going to be meeting with a, an architect and presenting uh, these ideas. And so we'd love for you to come and bring those at 5.30 today. And of course, we're going to, at the end of the uh, meeting, we're going to go up on the property and join hands together and have a word of prayer and trust God to make this vision a reality, okay? Well, you know, I want to start off talking to you today about, you know, last week we looked at the Great Commission a little bit and how the Lord Jesus told us, uh, a lot of people are asking the question, what is it that God wants me to do? What is God's plan for my life? We answered that last week. God told us very clearly in Matthew 28 to go and do what? To go and make disciples. And so with that, I want to ask, I believe, a very pertinent question. You know, how do we make disciples? What do we tell them? <laughs> how do we accomplish this task? Um, you know, it's a very important task. Nietzsche, if you ever heard his name, he was an atheist. He was an ungodly man. He looked at the church and he considered Christianity for himself. He came to the conclusion, here's what he said. He said, if you want me to believe in your Redeemer, then you're going to have to look a little more redeemed. And so he said no to the church. He said no to Jesus Christ. You see, dear friend, it paints a very important truth that this lost world around us, their, their understanding of God is not going to come from the Bible because they're not reading the Bible. Their understanding of God is going to come from your life and my life. And so when we say that we know the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, listen, we must appear to be redeemed and not just appear to be redeemed, but truly be redeemed. Now, I laid out for you last week three types of Christians that are living in our culture. And I gave you the statistic that just over 70% of the American population claims to be Christian, claim to be Christ followers. But there is a real problem. And so if I could, could just identify those three groups again, um, I call them, I didn't read this, I just am going to put uh, in the three categories what I believe is going on in our culture. And so, first of all, it was the unnatural Christian. And if I can define that, that's someone who claims to know the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet they're living in sin and they have no power. They, they're not experiencing uh, the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And so, you know as well as I do, if you claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you 
will never be comfortable in sin. Okay? Uh, never. If you know Him, His Spirit bears witness with your spirit. You know you're a child of God. He chastens whom He loves. He scourges us if He has to. And so we cannot live in sin. The second that I mentioned was the natural Christian. And I said that this is the average church-going Christian. They are satisfied with their salvation. They're very comfortable in their life. But let me just say this, and you may not like it, but I believe it's true. The average Christian lacks urgency. They don't have a lot of urgency about it. And so then, thirdly, we talked about the supernatural Christian, and this is what I want you to be. Uh, I pray that you will seek the Lord through this series and that you will dream his dreams for your life. Become the supernatural Christian. This is the Christian who's filled with the Spirit of God, they walk with the Lord, and they have an urgency about them. And they know, I need to serve the Lord. I need to make a difference. I want to have an impact. And so, um, you know, that's, that's my prayer for you. Um, you know, I also mentioned uh, last week that maybe for a long time we've been doing church the wrong way. Uh, many times about programs, many times about uh, what are the children doing, what are the youth doing. Uh, you know, this event, that event, and so forth, and the adults, and all of these things. We have, you know, many times great programs. We have some great Bible studies even. We have some good things going on. But what did Jesus tell us to do? He told us to make disciples. That's what he told us to do. Go and make disciples. And so I want to challenge you, dear friend, this morning that... If you're heading up something, you're doing something, you're leading something, the ultimate goal of it, it should be making disciples in the church. And in your life spiritually. But, you know, we have a mission statement around here that we believe should guide us in all things, and that is that we are a church on mission to win and build and send. That's our goal. That's our mission. That's what we're going to be about. I want to take that mission statement and I want to compare it to the mission that's going to be laid out in Scripture here in Acts chapter 2. And I want to see how, how they line up. And, uh, and maybe we need to make some changes. Maybe we don't with that statement. But certainly, we need to go and make disciples. So what do we do? What is our purpose? If you've got your outline, number one, I'd love for you to write this down. And let me just say this, dear friend. If you're here and you know that the commission is to make disciples then that, I want to tell you how we're going to do that, all right? And so as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is an outline that we need to live by. And secondly, we need to take other people and help them to live out what we're going to talk about today, okay? So number one, we are to exalt the Savior, all right? We are to exalt Him. You see, the day of Pentecost has come, all of these signs and wonders, they've been done. The Holy Spirit has come and baptized that motley crew into the body of Christ, those disciples. Peter stands up to preach the gospel, and here's what he says. I want you to see in Acts chapter 2, look at verse 22. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst. And you yourselves also know, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified. Look at what he said. You, you've taken him by your lawless hands, and you have crucified him. You put him to death. But God raised him up. Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. And therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. Let's go to the Lord together. Ask his presence here today. Father, we come before you, Lord, and we ask you, Lord Jesus, to speak to our hearts today. God, we have a great need today, Lord. We need you to open up our eyes. Help us, Lord, to be willing vessels today 
to carry out this great commission. God, I ask you to speak to every heart. I ask you, Lord, to soften our hearts, God, today. God, that we may say yes to your Holy Spirit and his leading today. God, I pray that you will move. I pray that you will speak to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, Peter, from what we just read, he stands up, he preaches this message. And it's easy to understand that it's a plain Christ-centered gospel message. The church grew because he lifted up Jesus. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 12 and verse 32, Jesus said that if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples unto myself. Now let me just say this, dear friend. No church, uh, no children's ministry, uh, no youth ministry, no adult ministry, in my estimation, is going to be a growing vibrant group producing eternal fruit that does not exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is what we are to be doing. We, we want to exalt the Lord. I thought about it this morning. We don't want to come here and sing any songs that a Unitarian could enjoy. We want to sing songs about Jesus. We want to lift up and exalt His name. And let me just say this. Every church service we should come to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe every activity that we do as a church should be to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that. I pray that you believe that. And so let's look at the message that Peter preached concerning Jesus. It's a simple outline. I'd love for you to write this down. Uh, he shares the message that we need to be sharing with this lost and dying world around us. And so first of all, letter A here, Peter preached about the manner of his life, the manner of the life of Jesus. Look at verse 22, if you will. He said that he was a man attested by God to you by God by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. You know, someone wrote this about the manner of the life of Jesus, and he said, I am far within the mark when I say that all of the armies that have ever marched, and all of the navies that were ever built, and all of the parliaments that have ever sat, all of the kings who have ever reigned, put them all together, and they have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as the one solitary life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? I believe that's true. Jesus Christ has affected a lot of people's lives. And He is affecting people's lives today. Some of you are here this morning and you could stand and say, I love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of my heart. Yes, He's very real to me. And so we are to exalt Him. The manner of His life Peter preaches about. But I want you to notice letter B, the meaning of His death. Look at verse 23. It says, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by law's hands, have crucified, and put to death. What is he saying here? He's saying that Jesus Christ's death was not an accident. It was not an incident. He had planned it. It had been planned before the foundation of the earth. Dear friend, please understand this. Nothing went wrong. Nothing went wrong. God was not up in heaven wringing his hands and saying, Oh my goodness, what are we going to do now? They're going to crucify him. No, no, no. It was planned. And you see, the purpose of the cross, as we learn from this message that Peter preaches, is substitution. Drina and the praise team led us in the song, I am redeemed. Dear friend, that was the plan all along. That Jesus would become our redeemer. The just would take the place on the cross for the unjust. Christ died for us. He took our place. And you know what? We must not only speak of his sinless life, but also his vicarious death. That he died upon the cross to pay a sin debt that he did not owe. You know what? You take that message out. Many people are taking that message out today. You take the message of the cross out. 
You know what? It would be like taking water out of a well. It would be like taking the blue out of the sky. It would be like taking uh, notes out of music, uh, numbers out of mathematics. I mean, you remove the cross. What do you have left? Dear friend, it's everything. It's everything. Peter exalted the Savior. He talked about the manner of his life, the meaning of his death, but he also talked about the miracle of his resurrection. Look at verse 24. He says, Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he would be held by it. You see, death cannot keep its prey when it came to the Lord Jesus. You know, I'll paint a kind of a scenario for you. I've been walking around the, the house and uh, here lately I've noticed some things out of place. Some very big things out of place. And I thought I would ask myself, who in the world did this? And then I, I, later, a few days later, I'd find something else that was out of place. I thought, who in the world did this? And I kept asking, and I asked the boys, boys, did you do that? No, Dad, we didn't do that. We didn't do that. Huh. Who in the world moved that? Who, who threw that over there? And so I'm walking around, I see all these things, and I'm asking, who keeps doing this? So I thought, I'm going to find out. So I set out a little trail camera. I put out a little bit of bait. I went down and checked the camera, and I thought, hmm, there's the culprit. I pictured, had these pictures of this big black bear. He's messing with the honeybees. He's messing with all kinds of things. And I've got pictures of him doing it. Well, you know what? Can you imagine? I've also noticed that there's not a lot of deer around. I'm finding all of these turkey feathers all around. I'm not seeing a lot of animals, but I'm seeing the evidence of this bear. And so I just started thinking, I bet these animals are awfully kind of upset, you know? Let me give you kind of a children's story to represent what I'm talking about. One day, hypothetically, I'm just saying, I'm making this up, right? But this is kind of like our Lord. One day, this bear crawls in his den to lay down and take a nap. I just was thinking about the resurrection of our Lord. And this spider gets awfully upset. And he has this bright idea. He said, when the bear is in there, I'm going to weave a web the entire time he's in there asleep, and I'm going to close him in. So he worked that spider endlessly, day and day, hour, minute after minute, hour after hour, trying to enclose this bear. He thinks to himself, I'm going to be the hero. The deer are going to thank me. Everybody's going to thank me. And he's, he's thinking, I'm going to be the hero. And so he works and he's weaving this web. And the bear wakes up. That was terrible, I know. And he stretches and he kind of moans. And he walks out of that den. Never even knew the web was there. You know what, dear friend? I, I thought about that and I thought, you know what? Satan was saying the same thing. When Jesus died on that cross and they put him in that rich man's tomb, Satan was saying, you know what? Yes! Finally, we got him! You know what? He's buried. He's in there. His name will be done away with. He will not rise. But you know what? Like that bear walking out of that den, Jesus did not even know the power or the sting of death. He walked out of that den like the web wasn't even there. You see, up from the grave, he arose in a mighty triumph over his foes. Dear friend, the miracle of his resurrection. People, listen, Peter preached about it. You must tell others about it. Then, the, then Peter preached about the magnificence of his reign. Look at verse 33 to 35. It says, therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you, know, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. I don't know about you, but I love that word until. That little word tell, you know, in essence, where is Jesus right now? He has ascended into the high hills of glory. What is he doing? He is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. 
You see, Peter is preaching on this day that Jesus is exalted, that He is Lord of lords, that He is King of kings. You see, dear friend, you said here today, maybe you're not a believer. But I want to tell you, dear friend, with all of the unction, all of the function, and the emotion of my soul, that one day you will confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I have a question for you today. As Christ's followers, what is your duty? What is your privilege? What is your mandate? What is your joy? You see, it first of all is to exalt the Savior. Dear friend, would you do yourself a blessing? Would you take this thought and examine your life and, and pray, say, oh God, how? In what manner can I exalt you greater than I am? Lord, how can I praise you greater than I have been? Lord, how can I live for you and make much of you and worship you and exalt you in ways that I am not? Let me give you the second truth we find here from Peter's sermon. The instruction to the church. We see that we are to, number two, we are to evangelize the sinner. You see, go and make disciples. Part of making disciples is to evangelize, to share with them the good news. Dear friend, I have a question for you. Jesus Christ, we sang about it this morning, is He good news? What He did for you on the cross is that good news. How He saved you from that old man, how He has birthed inside of you a new man, that new nature is that good news. Oh, dear friend, that is good news. Look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You see, let me just tell you what true evangelism is. Let me give you the marks of it. They're right here. What are the steps to a true conversion? When someone, please don't miss this. This pertains to you. This pertains to everybody. What are the steps that take, take place when someone comes to the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved? What are the steps? We'll see letter A here under number two. First of all, people must be convicted by the Lord. People must be convicted. Look at verse 37. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Did you see that? You ever been in a worship service where people began to weep? Where people began to cry? Where people began to tremble because of the moving of the Holy Spirit of God? Where the Holy Spirit of God so grabbed their hearts? You ever been a part of something like that? You know, yesterday my wife and I went... And uh, I asked her on our way, where do you want to go? Whoops. I asked her, I said, where do you want to go? Do you want to, I know you've got some things to do. Do you want to go to Marshall's or do you want to go to Ross? She said, I want to go to Ross. I said, why not Marshall's? She said, well, I'm looking for a certain something. I think I'll find a better deal at Ross. I said, let's go to Ross. <laughs> and so we went into Ross. I want to tell you something. It was all by divine appointment. I saw this lady at a distance. I used to be her youth pastor. And she was kind of walking to me, but it was like she didn't know who it was. And I said, hey, I know you. It's been almost 10 years. And she looked at me and she said, she came over, she gave me a hug and I asked her this question. I said, are you still growing in the Lord? That was the first words out of my mouth. She began to cry. She began to weep. I thought, oh my goodness, what have I gotten myself into? And she began to share with me her struggles, share with me about her life. I looked at her, I said, I want to tell you something. God allowed us to bump into each other today. God's got a plan of He's going to work in your life. My wife walked up and we were able to console her and talk to her. And my wife got her phone number. And so we're going to follow up with her. Dear friend, let me tell you something. What was that? 
That was the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. Most people want to hide those tears. Most people don't want, to, want people to see. You know, when someone asks you, hey, how are you doing? We may be falling apart on the inside, but we'll stick our chest out and say, oh, I'm doing great. How are you doing? She didn't do that. Because the Holy Spirit of God convicted her. And I want to tell you something, dear friend. People must be convicted by the Lord. Amen? Amen? Let me give you the second thing. Not only in a true conversion, not only is there conviction, but then people must be converted to the Lord. Look at verse 38. Peter said, Repent and let, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a key word here. Peter says, Let every one of you repent. Repent of your sin. Repent of your wicked ways. Repent of that immoral lifestyle. Repent. That's what he's saying. What does repent mean? Repent means that you have a change of mind about a few things. I want to give you three of them, okay? You, you write this down if you would in your outline. Number one, you have a change of mind about sin. You see, when you repent and you come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, you have a change of mind about sin. Let me tell you, you've never been saved. If you haven't, haven't had a change of mind about sin, you've never been saved. Jesus said in Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Dear friend, there is a change of mind about sin, but you know what else? You have a change of mind about yourself. You have a change of mind about yourself. You understand, you know what, I don't have what it takes to overcome this sin. I don't have what it takes to have the peace in life that I need. I don't have what it takes in and of myself to do what it is that God wants me to do. And so you learn no more confidence in the flesh. You have a change of mind about yourself. But you know what else? You have a change of mind about Jesus Christ. You understand, He's my only hope. And you put your faith where God has put your sins upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And dear friend, when, when this transpires, there is conversion. But then what happens? Look at letter C here. Thirdly, you must make a confession of the Lord. Acts 2 verse 38. Look at it with me if you will. Then Peter said to them, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the remission of your sins. Did you see that? He says you get baptized. You see, dear friend, back then when someone made a decision for the Lord, they didn't walk down an aisle. They went and got baptized. When someone said, you know what, I want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I give my life to Jesus. Their method of making that known was baptism. Their method of preaching that message was to be baptized. And so what is the conversion of the sinner? Listen to it. It is the conviction by the Lord. It is the conversion to the Lord. It is the confession of the Lord. And dear friend, listen to this. It is controlled by the Lord. I know some of you just sit here and you say, I don't like that word control. Well, I'm trying to keep with the C's first of all. All right? But secondly, I want you to know, control by the Lord is a very good thing. Anybody sitting in this sanctuary this morning with half a brain would acknowledge that, you know what, I'd rather Him control and guide my life than me try to control and guide my life. Amen. I have a question for you. How many of you tried to control and guide your life before? You tried to have it your way. Huh? You, you tried to do it your way. I'm full of questions today. I have another question for you. How'd that work out for you? Huh? What'd you say, Brother John? <laughs> you sound like that bear. <laughs> bad. It didn't work out too well. How many of you can say the same? So different control by the Lord. I want the Lord to control my decisions. I want Him to guide me. He'll never lead me the wrong way. Look at verse 38. Controlled by the Lord, Peter said, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
You know, the Holy Spirit comes into your life to guide you. The Holy Spirit comes into your life to lead you. And you know, the Holy Spirit takes possession of a person because they have been bought with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, real salvation is not just to believe something or to achieve something. Real salvation is to receive someone. The Holy Spirit of God comes into you. Real salvation is not just getting heaven when you die. Heaven is a byproduct. You see, salvation is not getting man out of earth and into heaven. Salvation is getting God out of heaven into man. Does that make sense? That's what happens in salvation. And so there is a conviction by the Lord, a conversion to the Lord. It is a confession of the Lord. It is to be controlled, to be guided by the Lord. But I want to give you a last thing. Another truth. People must continue in the Lord. You see, look at verse 41 and 42. Then those who gladly received His Word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now, that's why we do what we do when we use the word evangelism. You see, that's why we tell the story. That's why we teach the story. That's why we preach its message. Why? That people might be convicted. That they might be converted. That they might make a confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. That they might be guided. That is controlled by the Holy Spirit. And that they may go on and on with the Lord in continuance of the Lord with steadfastness. Yeah, I love what Adrian Rogers said. He said, the faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. What does he say? The same thing that Jesus said. Jesus said, they went out from us because they were not of us. Had they been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. Does that make sense? If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, question for you. If you know Him, how? How can you walk away from such a love, such a relationship, such a heart? And go and say, no, I choose this. You see, you don't really know Him. Because if you knew Him, you would run to Him and not from Him. Let me give you... The third thing. Now the question last week was that, that really the command was go and make disciples. And so the question today is how do we make disciples? Dear friend, listen to me. I want to give you some things right now that you and I are to do. I mean, we are to live these things out as Christ followers. This is what Peter tells the church. Hey church, listen. This is what we need to do. And you know what? Not only do we do these things because we love our Lord, but we lock arms with somebody else. And we do these things with them. That's how we make disciples. Jesus said go make disciples. Are you with me? Are you awake? Are you following me? Alright? And so this is the message to the church. Let me give you number three here. Enlist the saint. We evangelize the sinner. We bring them to Christ. You know, just prior to the 830 service, a lady came up to me and she said this. She said, from the message, going and making disciples, I got really convicted over my boss at work. And she said, you know what? I know I could have lost my job. But she said, I listened to the leading of the Lord. Here's what she said right before the 830 this morning. She said, she said, I shared the gospel with my boss. And my boss accepted Christ as her Savior this week. And she said, ever since then, every single day of the week, we've been talking about Jesus. So, dear friend, listen, if you know of somebody who claims to know the Lord, but they're not walking with the Lord, you need to go get them and help them walk with the Lord. You know somebody who is, maybe you led to Christ or someone who's recently come to Christ. Listen, we need to enlist the saints. Number three, let me tell you how to do that. But look at verse 42. Once they got saved, once they came to Christ, what did they do? What do we do? What are we supposed to do as Christ followers? 
Look at verse 42 again. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Dear friend, listen. Great churches are Bible-centered churches. Great Christians, those who follow the Lord and build a great Christian life, they are Bible-centered people. The text here tells us, verse 42, they continued in doctrine. Did you get that? You see, that's just another way of saying they continued in the Word of God. Dear friend, as a Christian, if you're going to disciple others, you must be growing in the Lord. You must be reading your Bible. I got so excited that one of the college students come up to me at the end of the early service and they said, you know what? I feel led to read my Bible through over the next year. How do I do that? I want more of the Word of God in my mind and in my heart. I said, okay, settle down just a moment. I mean, she was fired up. I can't wait to do this. And praise God for that. So how do we grow? How do we help others grow? How do we disciple others? How do we do this? Letter A, I want you to write this down. You get involved and you get them involved in Bible study. Bible study. Bible study is for prayer, care, share. You get involved in Bible study. Reading the Word of God. Listen, let me give you letter B here. What are we to do? We get involved in fellowship. Fellowship, dear friend, look at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Can I tell you this? Fellowship is not incidental. Fellowship is absolutely fundamental to your life as a Christ follower. The Bible never teaches this idea of a lone range of Christianity that you can do it all on your own. You cannot do it all on your own. Hey, wait just a moment. Look, look, look. Look at me just for a second. I want to tell you something. You need me. And I need you. We need each other. We need each other. God didn't call us to do this alone. We're a family of God. Listen, we are to encourage one another. We are to love one another. We, we are to win the world to Jesus together. Listen, we need to get to know each other. That's why we have Sunday school. We have life groups. Why? So that you can get in the context of a small group and get to know your family. Dear friend, I have something that I want you to understand. If you just come here to a service on Sunday, hear the preaching, and walk out the door and go have your Whopper sandwich, go home and put your feet up, you will never get to know your family. The family of God that you're a part of. So you know what? When we have functions, even like tonight, where we're having a building committee meeting, you should come. You can get to know somebody else. We have life groups. We have Sunday school. We have these gatherings where we get together and we converse. You know what? One thing that I love so much, dear friend, fellowship is not incidental. Uh, I believe a part of a healthy ministry is fellowship. They fellowship. Baptists in the Baptist world, that means they ain't together. <laughs> it's not what that Greek word means. But you know what? Fellowship. We need each other. Mike Chittam last Wednesday took your middle schoolers to Bratcher's Ice Cream. I said, Mike, there he is. I was looking for you. I said, Mike, why are you doing that? He said, I want, here's what he said. I want our middle school students to fellowship. That was his exact words. I thought about that as I was putting this sermon together. Because the same word he used is the same word that's right here. Fellowship. You get to know each other. Why? So that there's accountability. There's, there's strength when you know each other. There's, there's accountability. There, there's comfort. There's somebody you can call when you need to talk to somebody. All the men said amen. amen. Let me give you ten, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Look at this. It says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Why do we get together to stir up love and good works? But watch this. Verse 25. 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. Some are forsaking getting together with the family. But watch what he says. But exhorting one another. And so much the more. As you see the day approaching. What is he talking about? He's talking about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to step out on the clouds in the sky and He's going to call the church home. That great trumpet's going to blow. And in the twinkling of an eye, those who are dead in Christ are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and all of those who remain are going to meet the Lord. Together we will meet Him in the air. That's the day He's talking about. You know, we're studying Revelation on Wednesday night. Dear friend, you're going to see that day is approaching, could be today, and he says here in Hebrews, all the more. Listen, if there's ever a time that you live for Jesus, this is the time. If there's ever a day that you've lived for and worked for and loved him, served him, saved to him, loved him, greeted others in the name of Jesus, today is today. That's what he's saying. Dear friend, can I tell you this? When people come into this church, they need a look. They need a handshake. They need to be approached. They need to be talked to. They need to be loved on. And listen, you, you own that ministry. You know, every church uh, tends to have greeters. I know we're having a greeter meeting, a luncheon next Sunday after this service. And I believe the church should have greeters. Greeters point people in the right direction. Greeters help seat people. Greeters do a lot of different things. But one thing they do is greet people. One thing you're going to hear in that training, Brian's going to help lead that, is that you need to be loving to people. You know, you need to, uh, you need to be happy. You need to brush your teeth. Put the odor on. You know, dress up a little bit. Don't stand there looking like you're eating lemons right before they walked up. But you know what? I want to tell you this today. Every single one of you should be a greeter. Every single one of you should go and be greeting people that you do not know and loving on people when they come here with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you something. Listen, when, when, a, when a visitor comes here, they should leave from here saying that. Is the, I don't know what's going on in that place, but something is different about that place. You know what? Before Roxanne and I came here, we had two weeks and we went and visited churches. And I remember walking in one church that was growing and I left there thinking, how are they growing? Because you know there was only one person that shook my hand and said, hello, you know who it was? It was the pastor at the front door when we were leaving. Dear friend, that should not be us. It cannot be us. You know what? We need fellowship. We need small groups. We need to be a part of them. We enlist people in these things. We have fellowship activities. We just, the marriage class just went, I mentioned Mike, we just went to Mike's house. We had a day in the lake, the marriage ministry, and we grew it out, we played cornhole, and, and we, we did these things. We fellowship, we love, we encourage one another. We must be doing these things. And when you do them, you invite people to come with you. That's called discipleship. Let me give you another truth here. We enlist people in Bible study and fellowship and in worship. Look at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. You know, many people interpret breaking bread here and, and, and really as prayer. Obviously, prayer is an act of worship. And we must always maintain the worship service and teach others how to worship. And so, dear friends, you bring people with you and you teach them the importance of the worship service. That's what discipleship is all about. Listen, I asked you last week, how many of you are discipling somebody? I have another question for you. When's the last time you went up to somebody that you knew was away from God or didn't know the Lord? And you, here's what you said to them. Hey, I go to this church, 11 o'clock service. How about you and your family come with us to breakfast? And then we'll go to church together. You look like a deer in the headlights. Why don't you do that? Why don't you invite somebody to come? 
You see, that's called discipleship. And I want you to notice letter D. You also, once you have someone and you're helping someone do these things and you're doing these things yourself, then it is you get folks involved in stewardship. Look at verse 43. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done to the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now notice verse 45. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them amongst all as anyone had need. You see, none of them said, what's mine is mine. This is my house. That is my car. This is my money. No, no, no. Listen, the point is that everything that they owned, they made at the disposal of the Lord Jesus Christ to use it as He would lead. Dear friend, you can't get the idea that one day belongs to God and the other six belong to you. Right? You can't get that idea. Listen, they all belong to God. And let me just tell you this about stewardship. What you don't willfully and joyfully give, God doesn't want. You cannot love the Lord and not give back to Him. Dear friend, if you are not giving to His, to His work in some way, you need to start doing that today. It'll be a blessing to you, I promise you. Start giving in some way. Let me give you the last point here. We'll wrap this up. We get folks involved in stewardship, but we also get them involved in evangelism. You see this process from Bible study to fellowship and stewardship and worship and evangelism. Look at verse 46. And so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. Dear friend, let's go to the Lord together as we close. I want to ask you a question. I pray today that you sit here with an excitement in your heart. I mentioned last week that man, maybe the church has been doing church wrong for a long time. You see, we're called to make disciples. And dear friend, as you look at this process that, that Peter preaches, that Peter lays out to the church, he in essence is taking the words of Jesus and he is saying, this is what we are to be about. Dear friend, this is the vision. You see, this is what we are to do. We're not just to draw our breath and draw our salary and drag into heaven with a wasted life. We're to be used by God. We're to have an impact. We're to make a difference. Dear friend, I want to ask you something. The Great Commission, as you ponder it, as you think about it, to go into the world and make disciples, Jesus is speaking to you as you know Him. He is saying, you, come and do this with me. Your hands bowed, your eyes closed. I just this week was reading... The words of Jesus early in the Gospels as He looked at Peter and He looked at James and He looked at John and He said, Hey, you, come and follow Me. I will make you to be fishers of men. He's saying those same words to you. Come and follow Me. I'll make you to become fishers of men. Dear church, do you want to be a part of this? Do you want to be a part of this vision? Do you want to say yes to what it is that God is calling you to do and that is make disciples as a Christ follower? you want to be a part of this? I want to, if so, I want to, I want you to pray a very simple prayer this morning. Jesus is saying, come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. A simple prayer would be, Lord, I want to be a part of that. Lord, would you make me a part of that? 
Show me, Lord, what part I am to have. Lord, I want to follow you. I want to live out the Great Commission. I want to disciple somebody. Can you pray that? Lord, I want to be used to take this message today that is very simple, these very simple truths, and to take the life of someone who's not living this way and to help them to be a disciple. And dear Christian, today if God spoke to your heart and you prayed that simple prayer with me, would you stand to your feet right now? If you prayed that, Lord, I want to be a part of the Great Commission. Lord, I want to go. Lord, I want to be a part of making disciples. Lord, I want to do Bible study. I, I want to worship. I want to, to be a part of evangelism. Lord, I want to do these things because it's what you've told me to do. And because I love you, I want to do these things. Dear God, today you see the hearts of your people. And God, I ask you today that you would lead your people. God, that you would work in our hearts, that you would use us to go and make disciples. Oh God, lead us, we pray. Dear friend, today I want to ask you, just as we close, if God spoke to your heart about something. Maybe you've been a little wayward. Maybe you've been away from the Lord. Maybe He spoke to your heart and said, Come. Come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Oh, dear friend, if God spoke to your heart, would you come down to the altar today? But you get on your knees before God and say a simple prayer like this, Lord, I can't. Oh God, I need you. If God spoke to your heart, oh dear friend, to follow Him and to lead others, would you come? Maybe God spoke to your heart in some other way. Oh dear friend, would you come today and say, God, maybe it's a simple prayer, Lord, I want to follow you. Maybe early in the service you said, I've tried it my own and I can't. Oh, dear friend, would you come today and follow Jesus, His plan, His will for your life? Would you come today? God spoke to your heart. Would you come back to Him today? Would you surrender your life to Him today? Say, God, not my will, not my plan, yours. God, your plan. Lord, I want to follow you you come. God spoke to your heart. Father, I thank you today for speaking to hearts. I thank you that your church would be sensitive, God, to your dealing with them. And Lord, I pray that you will lead your people, oh God. Lead this church, dear Lord, to make disciples. Oh, God, use this church, use your people, God, in this community, in this town. Oh, God, I pray that you will. Help us to make a lot of noise for you, Lord. That we might win others. That we might fulfill the Great Commission. That we might live your plan for our lives. It's so much better than our own plan. Oh, God, lead us in it. It is in your name that we pray these things. Brother Brian Fagan, would you close us today? Thank you, Brian. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for today. We thank you for a chance to get together and learn more about you and your plan for our lives. We just ask that you give us the strength and the boldness to go out and be what you call us to be, to win others to you and to walk with them and point them to you, Lord. Help us to be a peculiar people, as Peter put it different from the rest of the world, 
so that the rest of the world will look at us and want what we have, and what we have is you. So just help us to live that out the rest of the week, and bring us all safely back here again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.